All right, we are gonna go ahead and get started. Is everybody having a good morning so far? Woo! Yeah, I get excited. Um, so hopefully you're, you're, you are here to find out a little bit more about Joulebots. Uh, has anybody heard of Joulebots before? Okay, a couple hands, but I'm really excited to uh, teach everybody who doesn't know about them, uh, about why I love them so much. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Clicker on. All right, I uh, want to say thanks to all the sponsors. Uh, this is my second NDC event ever, and it blows my mind. Um, just the amazing conference they've put on, and a lot of that is really due to the sponsors uh, who are providing such amazing food and such amazing, bo amazing booths and bringing all the speakers out. So make sure to show them some love while you're at the conference. <clears throat> A little bit about me. My name is Jennifer Wadella, and you can follow me on Twitter at like OMG it's Fetty. I do like to warn people um, that I live treat, tweet trashy, trashy reality TV shows like The Bachelor in America. Um, so be aware if you follow me on Twitter Monday night, that's, that's what you're going to see from me. Uh, but by day, I'm a JavaScript developer. I work at a small legal tech startup where I'm from, um, writing Angular 2. Pretty happy. Anytime I get to write JavaScript, I'm happy. I'm a community organizer, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but I'm a huge diversity advocate. Spoiler alert, I'm a woman. Uh, you might not have seen that many of us running around the conference. This room is probably the best ratio you're going to see uh, during the conference, but that's a big part of what I do and um, a lot of the work I do within the community. And I'm actually a self-taught developer, so I have a little bit of a different perspective uh, when it comes to programming, teaching programming, and exploring untraditional pathways. Uh, I am from Kansas City, Missouri. It is in the smack dab of the middle of the United States. People make fun of us for being a flyover city, um, but we're actually pretty fantastic. But shh, don't let everybody know or then we'll get swarmed and I can't get into a cocktail bar with no weight anymore. <clears throat> uh, you might have noticed some stickers out front. If you did not notice, um, feel free to take some on the way out. But uh, those are stickers uh, for my nonprofit and a couple of the programs we run. And so I want to start the talk by um, talking a little bit about what I do. And a couple of years ago, I was the only female software engineer working at a technology company. Surprise, surprise. And the men I worked with were all fantastic, but there was definitely something lacking to me. Um, <clears throat> and just lacking that sense of camaraderie. And so I set out to change that, and I launched an organization called Kansas City Women in Technology. And our mission is to grow the number of women in technology careers in Kansas City. And there's no really one clear way to do that, and so we've launched a ton of events and programs based on what we've heard from the community to kind of solve this problem. So one of the first things we launched is Coder Dojo Kansas City. Is anybody familiar with Coder Dojo? Couple hands. Um, so Coder Dojo is actually a global nonprofit based out of Ireland, and they kind of started this idea of launching after-school coding clubs for kids. Uh, very open format. You can kind of do whatever works for you and works for your community. Um, but that's like a really great starting point. They've got a ton of great resources online. Our chapter, the way we run it, is we run every second Saturday of the month, and we found three-hour sessions are like the the sweet spot when we're running any sort of educational programs for kids. Um, three hours gets enough time to get on Wi-Fi if a parent has to reset a password account or somebody's locked out of their email, it's time to handle that, it's time to get them onboarded. Um, a little bit of, of teaching and learning time for them to get going, and then uh, the rest of the time is just work time. And it's really funny because three hours seems like a long time, especially if you're an, a parent for some eight-year-old, right? But you'll be kind of walking around the room as a mentor and these kids are coding and you check in with them and they're like, nope, nope, can't talk to you, I'm coding right now. And you're like, oh, okay, my bad, I'll go over here now. Uh, so it's really cool to see the level of engagement from those kiddos. Uh, we run very Socratic style, which means we don't have one set curriculum that we go through every day. We'll kind of have a general project prompt, whether it'll be learning for loops or some sort of theme, and we allow them to kind of explore, um, and they can use whatever tools they want, whether it's Scratch, whether it's HTML, whether it's JavaScript. We'll have kids walk in and they're like, I want to learn SQL, and we're like, uh, okay. And fortunately, with a bunch of programmers running around uh, mentoring at this program, we're normally able to pull something at our butts pretty quickly to um, accommodate one of our sort of requests we have. Uh, but one of the really cool things we do at the end of every Coder Dojo is we ask the kids to come up and present. And if their projects are on um, prompt or whatever the topic we're working on, and as long as there's no gross violence or bad words, we'll let them come up and present. Uh, because we don't just want to be teaching programming skills, we want to be teaching all the skills that are really necessary for, for people to be successful in the industry, whether that's presenting, whether that's peer mentoring, and that kind of thing. And it's really funny because if, uh, if we call for present, or we haven't called for presentations by like 11.15, which is our normal time, we're going to have like kids lined 
signed up and they're like, you didn't call for presentations yet. And we're like, oh, our bad, our bad. So they're so damn excited to get up there and show what they've worked on. Um, so it's a lot of cool. So that's kind of the way we run ours. Um, you can find way more information at uh, coderdojo.com or you can check out our website. Uh, but the next program uh, you see up there is Coding in Cupcakes, and you might have seen those cute pink stickers. Uh, when we first launched Coder Dojo, we'd get really interesting reactions from parents. We'd be at some sort of school tech night or a conference or something like that and have a table set up. And the programmer dads would run up to our booth as soon as they figured out what it was. And they'd be like, oh my gosh, I'll sign my daughter up. This sounds amazing. A lot of times we would be approached by mothers and they would come up and, and we'd talk about, you know, coding class for kids and they'd say, oh, I don't think my daughter would like that. Maybe I'll bring my son. And so it was really weird that we were having like this predisposition coming from the parents that were even blocking their daughters from trying technology, which is just poof. And so what do we do? We brand it, we make it pink, we make it girly, and all of a sudden we're selling out all the time and the mothers can't wait to get in. Um, yes, it's pink. I know some people have a problem with that, but I've got eight-year-olds pushing to GitHub pages via command line, so I don't really give a shit the color is. They're still learning pretty applicable coding skills. Uh, so from there, we launched Coding in Cocktails, which is a series for adult women wanting to learn how to code. Uh, again, funny thing happened in, in promoting our programs is we'd have women try and sign up for Coding in Cupcakes saying, well, I don't have a daughter and I couldn't find anybody to bring. Can I come learn coding anyway? And so we're in this really cool um, point in our city where, where women really want to learn and they understand that coding is such a powerful career path and they really want to get into it. And so a lot of the work myself and my organization does is all about um, making it more accessible and, and creating those pathways. Um, finally, we run Django Girls Camp. Kansas City and Django was actually another European or Django Girls was another European launched organization um, but it's a weekend long workshop they've built this amazing amazing curriculum and tutorial so you don't have to do any of that um, all geared around helping women learn how to build a website uh, using Django which is a Python framework um, so we run one of those once a year and that is always a blast and we'll have about a hundred women all excited learning how to code uh, so that's a, that's a bit of what I do on the side from when I'm not writing code uh, from nine to five and really is is the basis of this talk. Because <clears throat> when I talk about our nonprofit and I talk about what I do, especially at conferences, this is, this is what I get. Right. Uh, so, of course, what do I do? I create a talk around it. Uh, just kidding, because I was uh, backing Jewelbots on Kickstarters on Kickstarter for like at least two years before they came out, and then I was like, okay, now I'm really going to do this talk. Um, <clears throat> so let's take a step back, though. Why why are we here? Why do Jewelbots matter? Why do we need to create products just for girls? Why aren't girls getting into coding in the first place? And there are, again, multiple different answers. There's no like one key thing that we can fix. And so one of the first things is psychological barriers. Uh, we're going to see a lack of encouragement and role models that are really prohibiting. Um, girls are actually 60% more likely to pursue a STEM career if they see a woman in that career path uh, because they need to see somebody who looks like themselves in order to feel like they, they could be successful in that role. Uh, we've got a lot of gender-based marketing happened uh, starting around the 1960s. Uh, and the fact that tech isn't made for girls. And then, of course, uh, the never-ending societal pressures, which is something that we can't just fix overnight. Uh, so, does any of this look familiar to anyone? Yeah, yeah, right? Uh, so, this is how I got into coding, um, probably when I was middle school and high school. And, and if you haven't heard of some of these websites, this was the early social media. And so, um, Zango was a blog that you could go and write all your angsty teenager feelings in and like code your own HTML. And I had those super classy, like cascading JavaScript stars, right? Uh, I gotta love the early 2000s. Uh, we also had MySpace, which was, you know, kind of the first social media platform, but again, it was just this very ugly thing that you could customize and make your own and embed music to, like, share your emotions of the guy that didn't like me at the time, and somehow by coming to my MySpace page and listening to this audio track, he would know exactly how I felt about him. Uh, and then we have Neopets, which was... Uh, just another really fun interactive game and website that we could do all sorts of fun things building Neopets with. Um, and I kind of like to joke because all of this is so ugly in comparison to the, the internet we have today, right? When you look at the apps on your phone, they're beautiful, they're pristine, we've got this amazing UI and UX on them. There's nothing left to be desired there versus like the internet of my childhood was fugly. I had no option other than to make it pretty and make it reflect myself. And so it wasn't like I sat out to, I set out to learn to code. Coding was just a means to an end of, of my creative self-expression. 
And the problem we run into is we completely lost this very organic pathway because we've got a generation that is way more interested in consumption than creation because everything is already so pretty. So why the hell are they going to go and start playing with HTML and start playing with CSS? Uh, Minecraft is a really good step in the right direction because they can start to program and customize a little bit, but we lack so many pathways because we've created such a beautiful internet that there's no need to fix it. Um, so I do like to preface that because you'll hear the same story from a lot of women, especially my age, about our journeys into programming. Um, and, and the chuckles will always come up, especially with Neopets, because just mm, such nostalgia factor. Okay, uh, so back to psychological studies as far as girls not pursuing technology. Uh, I will say I read this study and it changed my life. And the study is about, uh, they took a group of 10-year-old boys and 10-year-old girls. Um, high IQs. And they presented them with challenging material and kind of observed what happened. And the really interesting thing they noticed was the boys, the higher their IQ, the more aggressively they took the challenge, the harder they pursued completion. Girls, the complete opposite. The higher the girl's IQ was, the more quickly she dropped that material. And so they take a step back, and, and these kids are only 10 years old, right? Society can't have done that much damage yet. Uh, but they started looking at the, the way we're talking to kids at that age. And when you look at development cycles and the way they grow, um, how do we typically describe boys, right? At that age, they might be a little more rambunctious. They might be a little more off task. They might be kind of, you know, going crazy versus girls will mature a little bit faster at that age, be able to stay on task pretty well. And so what are we telling the boys? We're saying, hey, pay attention. Hey, if you just focus, if you just do this, you can figure it out. And then we're telling the girls, oh, you're so smart. Oh, you're so good. Oh, you did a great job. And so we're getting very different messages sent to boys and girls. Boys are being taught if they keep at it, if they keep challenging themselves, they can figure it out. But girls are being praised for intelligence, and so they're coming off with this idea that intelligence is an innate trait, that they maybe have like this much intelligence, and if there's like a challenge up here that they don't immediately understand, they're just not smart enough for it. And this is something that definitely plagued me well into my adulthood. Um, I was, you know, top of the honors roll in high school, breezed through everything. I was in the advanced classes. I was in every club imaginable. I was in National Honor Society. I was in Sp Spanish National Honor Society. I was a bright girl. And then I got to college. And I'm flunking macroeconomics, but fuck econ anyway. But I'm crying on the phone to my mother, telling her I'm too stupid to be in college because I had never been challenged before in my life. I didn't immediately understand something. Therefore, I just wasn't smart enough to figure it out. And that followed me into my programming career, where I'd be approached by something that maybe I couldn't abstract right away, or that didn't really make sense right off the bat. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm just, I'm not smart enough to be that developer. I'm just, I'm just never going to be that good, right? And then I read this study, and I was like, poof, mind blown. It changed my damn life. And I hope it changes yours, too, because it really helped me shift my perspective, and granted, like, as, as a grown-ass woman, that intelligence is not innate. As long as I keep challenging myself and, and pushing and persevering, I will figure out the problem. Maybe it takes me a little longer than somebody else, but that's okay. And so one of the things we're very cognizant about in our workshops, all the coding classes we run, is encouraging this, this idea. We tell the kids, hey, everybody learns at different paces, and that's okay. Because there's nothing worse than having like a six-year-old and her sister like sitting down, and one's getting it faster than the other one, and then the other one has a meltdown because they're not as smart as the other sister, and then tears, and then nobody's happy. Uh, so this is, really plays into the way we work with kids. One of the other things we do at Coder Dojo, when I mention they come up and present, is we ask them, what was the hardest problem you had to solve? Because we want them thinking about the challenges they face and the fact that they've overcome them. Because that's what we want in the engineers of tomorrow, right? Not people who are going to hit, who are going to hit limits, but people who are going to hit a limit and say, "Fuck that, not okay," and go way further. Those are the engineers we want to be creating. And so this really plays into the way we talk to kids and the way we're um, thinking about what we're saying to them and the kind of messages we're giving. Uh, let's talk about role models. Not a role model. Does anybody recognize this GIF? Okay, a couple. Uh, this is from uh, Silicon Valley, which is a show on HBO in America that is um, cringingly exactly like what it's like to work in the software world. And so this is, this is Richard, one of the main characters, freaking out uh, because the girl he is dating um, uses spaces instead of tabs. But that's not a role model, right? Like a little girl isn't going to look at this and be like, I want to grow up and be like Richard. No. And so the fact that we have so few women that, that girls have easy access for to see as role models doesn't make them want to pursue this as a career, which is sad because this is the most amazing career in the damn world, in my opinion. <clears throat> uh, tech traditionally has not been made for girls. Are anybody pebble, pebblers? 
Pebble users? No? Okay. Um, so Pebble was one of the first smartwatches on the market. It was actually a Kickstarter project, and it came in very basic colors. I think, yeah, this is the original color, the white one. Uh, but maybe a year or two into production, they put out some really awesome new colors. They had the cerulean blue, and they had a really bright lime green, and heaven forbid, they had pink. And the internet lost its goddamn mind because, heaven forbid, somebody made a tech product that might be appealing to girls. And so this is the message we're getting all the time. We see a lot of technology products that are explicitly made for men. And it makes us feel a little unwelcome sometimes. And I'm not a huge pink fan myself, except when it comes to technology. Like, I've got a pink Xbox controller. I've got a pink DS. Like, that, that's just my thing. <clears throat> and why, why do colors matter? And it's because women and girls are subjected to so much more scrutiny than men ever are. Everything we do matters. What we do, what we wear, how we look like, what we say. It's not changing anytime soon. I'm a pretty pragmatic person. I would love the world to be a perfect place tomorrow, but it's not gonna be. And so what do we do? We create products that are gonna allow women to, to exist in the society and the boundaries we, we've created, unfortunately, for ourselves, but in a way that they can still feel empowered. <clears throat> All right, so enough with the downers. Let's talk about how to help. Exposure to jewel bots, yay! Um, I, I, I don't shut up about how much I freaking love jewel bots because, you know, five years into teaching girls in, in technology, it's just, it's such an amazing, so clearly built for them product that's a lot of damn fun and it's still awesome programming. Like, even the adults, as soon as we get them involved and start mentoring, they like go out and buy their own jewel bot. I mean, yes, they're designed for kids, but they're so much fun even for adults. <clears throat> Positive reinforcement. Going back to, to that, that study I cited, encouraging hard work, encouraging perseverance, making sure that we're really playing up that, no, not that you're just smart, but that you're making an effort, that you're trying, that you're continually trying to do better. That's, that's really what we need to focus on. Um, we need to have more female role models. Uh, there are some out there, surprisingly. <gasps> you just need to know who they are, so I'll talk about at least one of my favorites. Um, and then another big thing is helping her wardrobe reflect her empowerment, because again, society is going to judge us. No matter what the fuck we do, we are going to be judged. So we might as well look a little bit more acceptable while doing it. Who's heard of Simone Yurtz? Maybe you've heard of her title. Queen of Shitty Robots, uh, and, and there's a more age-appropriate version. But the reason I love her so much is she did, she builds these like endearing shitty robots. And it's one thing for like a, a young woman, right, to look at an engineer at NASA and be like, oh, oh, sending rockets into space, like that's 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 too robust. But I could build a shitty robot. Like anybody could build a shitty robot, right? And so it just has this like really endearing like approachability to it. Um, that, that is a lot of fun and it's it's so fun and it's so um, not intimidating that I think she's a really great role model for girls with, with all the content she puts out. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about clothing, because yes, it matters. Uh, when I was probably middle school, the new Star Wars started to come out. Yes, some of them were, were dumpster fires, but we're not going to talk about that. But I love Star Wars. Like, I, I was born a nerd. But I couldn't find a Star Wars t-shirt. I had to shop in the boys' section to find a Star Wars t-shirt because girls weren't supposed to like Star Wars or anything remotely nerdy. Uh, and, and so it's nice that we finally started to round the corner where companies have been like, oh, girls might want to be something other than a princess now. Um, maybe selling t-shirts that say, I'm too pretty to do math, aren't quite sending the message we want. Um, so we're really fortunate to have some amazing uh, new brands coming out, and they are out there. Uh, some of these are from an American company called Old Navy. Um, you can order them online. And then Crossing Arrows is a company that is actually local to my city, where a mom has a daughter who couldn't find anything that she felt reflected her identity shopping at the store, so her mom set out to change that um, by creating all these t-shirts, including the one that says Future Coder. Big fan of that one. <clears throat> All right, so what are jewel bots? Uh, they're a great way to get girls into code, which is why we are here. Uh, in all practicality, uh, they're friendship bracelets, and they uh, <clears throat> compare via Bluetooth, so there's a very huge social component to them, and they are programmable to write your own code. Uh, so we're kind of hitting all the bases that are really important here, because we need to be creating a product that girls can wear and use and not be judged by society. Again looking at my own personal experience, like I was definitely the girl being made fun of for like being in computer classes and playing Xbox with my friends on the weekends. Like I wasn't supposed to do that. And, and it definitely affected the way people treated me. And so the fun thing about Jewelbots is they are very um, fun and girly. You can accessorize them with, with all your fun stuff. Uh, but we're still writing some really cool code underneath. And because they're Bluetooth enabled, they're built to be used with friends. And at a young age, girls are taught very quickly. Socializing is one of the, the most predominant ways that they can um, exert influence and excuse you that's very loud okay 
<clears throat> so these were created by uh, two women, Sarah Chips and Brooke Moreland. Uh, you might recognize Sarah Chips. She founded an organization called Girl Develop It. Um, and similar to the one I run, Coding and Cocktails, it's an organization built uh, to help teach women how to code. They've got them all over the US. I'm not sure if they've expanded outside of now. But so she's been in this space of how do we... Goodness. That is obnoxious. Um, so she's been in the space of like, how do we get girls? How do we get women into this? And did a lot of a lot of great market research that had led to this. <clears throat> All right. So uh, has anybody used Arduino before? Sweet, you are going to be a Joulebots expert then, because these are programmed via the Arduino IDE um, using C++. Uh, some of the things I love about these are they are a technology product, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but they have forums and they have documentation. And that's such an important part of what we do in our jobs as developers, right? We'll go and we'll implement a new technology or a new library, and we'll need to read the documentation and figure out what's going on, and then the documentation doesn't work like you say it's supposed to work, and so then you go and dig through the source code, and then you can't find what you need there, and so you jump into Stack Overflow or some sort of forum and ask your question. We've got all those components and all those, all those things very organically built into Joulebots as they are. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about how we actually start to um, set up and program our Joulebots. Uh, this is what they're going to look like out of the package. Um, so you're going to have an orange strap. It comes with a, a gray strap, and it's going to include a uh, micro USB cord. Um, not that you don't have like a million of these laying around your house anyway. <clears throat> So everything you need included in the package. The key thing about your computer is because you do have to download the Arduino RDE, you are going to need admin permissions. Hopefully everybody can download software to their own computers. But um, some people use work computers and sysadmins are on like a high horse and, oh, no, you can't download anything I don't approve personally. Um, so be aware of that. You do need USB ports. Um, with the new MacBooks, this has become an issue. So you have to make sure you always have your adapter on so you can have a USB port. Uh, so, if you've never used Arduino before, uh, this is what it looks like. That is so loud. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I've got a couple basic sketches pulled up here, but we need a couple things before we can actually get started. And we need to paste in the boards that we're going to actually need to run our Joulebots. These are available in my slides, or you can copy and paste them from the documentation on the website. But what we're going to do is we're going to go into, into our um, preferences. And I'm really sorry, there is not a possible way for me to zoom in on this. But um, you'll see down here, we have our additional boards manager. This is where we're going to go ahead and paste in our board, hit OK, um, and then move on. Uh, we go ahead and restart our IDE. Now, we have to do one more step, which is actually installing these boards. So we're going to go to Tools, Board, uh, Boards Manager. And in here, I can actually go and start typing uh, jewel bots, which will automatically pull up my boards and click into them. Um, if there's an update, for instance, uh, we got a new firmware update a couple months ago that gave us some really cool new colors. This is how you would go and do that uh, to update everything. Uh, so we have three boards that we're going to be working with. We've got a solo coding board, we've got a factory firmware uh, board, and a friendship coding board. So here are how to get those all. <clears throat> and again, all this is available online in the documentation in my slides. But so we get our slides with, or our boards, which I already have on mine because I code with Joulebots all the time, install them and restart our ID. <clears throat> all right, so let's talk about uh, the base functionality that comes with Joulebots. The thing we're really excited about is friendship mode, right? Because coding is more fun with friends. Uh, so one of the first things is if you ever see bugginess from your Joulebot, uh, your, your step one of debugging is to make sure your firmware is updated. And so we can go through and install a firmware board, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, but that's kind of your, your base step, especially if you like you try and pair your Joulebot out of the box and anything goes weird. OK, um, so I've actually never been to Oslo before, which means I don't have a lot of friends here. So I'm going to need two friends to come up and help me demo. Got a hand there. Got a hand there. Oh, behind you. Yep. All right. So I'm going to put some instructions up for how we're going to pair these. Stairs are on this side. Sorry. All right. <laughs> Should I go nope, nope, you're right up here with me. <laughs> it gets a little warm up here with the lights. So. All right, so you ladies can go ahead and put your jewel bots on. These are my, my custom straps I made. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> you're fine. Clearly sewing is not my best, uh, my best skill. Next year. I actually have like a yeah a half done video of how to do like custom straps. I might upload it someday. All right. Okay. 
All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna turn our toolbot on. And the thing you need to know is, is there's one button, we call it the magic button, okay? And it's just in the middle, so you can click down and feel it and it'll start to light up and give you those pretty LED colors and it'll buzz. Yay, it's on! Okay, so your instructions are down here, so if you need to refer to them, that's fine. But the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put our JewelBots in pairing mode, and I'm gonna pair with you first, and we'll, we'll be friends, and then you guys can be friends, okay? <laughs> All right, so to put our JewelBots into pairing mode, we're gonna press our, bu our magic button down for two seconds. But uh, we, we count a little differently in the JewelBots world. Um, in America, we have this really long state named Mississippi. And so we use that as a counting mechanism. So when little kids are playing hide and go seek, like, and they're supposed to cover their eyes and, and count to 10, if they're like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, that's not fair. So we go one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. So uh, when we're in jewel bots, we count to Mississippi. So to put our jewel bot in pairing mode, we're gonna press down and go one Mississippi, two Mississippi. And then it'll blink kind of this white color. Pressing. Oh, you turned it off, too long. All right, I'll count with you. All right, uh, here, let go real quick. All right, now it's back on. Give it a second. Taking the timing down always, always takes a minute. All right, so press down. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. Aha, now we're in pairing mode. All right, so whoever got theirs into pairing mode first, their lights are gonna start to circle. And we've got four different friendship modes to choose from. We've got red, green, blue, or um, cerulean. So we're gonna be blue friends. And so I click the magic button when it cycles around to the friendship color I want. And they're gonna take a second to sync up and then they're both gonna light up this color blue. Doop, doop, doop. Aha, yay, we are now blue friends. All right, so now you two try pairing and you're gonna be a different color friends. So you can have up to four different friendship colors. All right. So now you get to choose. Green. Oh, press the, it's press in the middle. middle. Yep. Not blue, not blue. All right, so you're gonna be red friends? All right. Oh. Yay! All right, so yours is gonna look extra special in a moment. All right, so <laughs> she actually has red colors and blue colors. So basically, your jewel bot is gonna light up with whatever colors of your friend are in, in Bluetooth range, whatever Bluetooth range is. I feel like it changes day to day and depending on uh, the thickness of the walls. So if one of you were to run down the hallway, then the colors would go out, but I'm not gonna make you do that. You guys are just gonna have to believe me or you can try it later for yourselves. Okay, so we are now friends. What do we wanna do with our friends? We wanna send messages. So I'm gonna put some instructions up for you guys. Um, so when we want to put our jewel bots into uh, messaging mode, we're gonna click the button once. Um, yep, and just a quick click. Yep, and then it's gonna start circling colors. And so you're pretty cool. You've got two different friends. So you get to pick which one of us to message from. So you select your friend based on the color. All right, so she's gonna message me. And then you can either send me a short buzz or a long buzz. So you can like do one Mississippi. Oops, sorry. You have to do it pretty quickly or it'll go back into the normal mode. So now you're back into messaging mode. Yep. And then, yeah, there you go. And so you can send different length buzzes. Um, and so that's kind of cool because, oh, we can make jokes about creating a secret code because we could use binary to send zeros and ones and yay, I just got message. All right, so um, I will let you guys uh, practice messaging each other real quick. <laughs> it takes a moment to get the timing down. You guys are actually doing it way faster than my normal demo. I normally have like a little dance prepared that I do while they're figuring it out. Just kidding. Oh. Oh. Might take a moment. Waits for buzz. Pretty know, much. Right? Not <laughs> it always it always takes a little bit of practice. All right. So you hit it. Yep. Oh, I got it now. <laughs> and you're probably going to get like five now. <laughs> yeah, Yay! Said a lot of, a lot of buzzes. <laughs> awesome. All right. So you guys were amazing demoers. I'm going to call you back up in a moment. But for now, um, if you will take your jewelbots off and pass them around in the audience so you guys can play with them. And if you get one that has blue lights, you can buzz me while I'm up here speaking. I know, fun times, right? Okay, uh, so moving on, let's kind of talk through what we have available. Uh, we just demoed kind of the base functionality that the JewelBots come with. And I really like starting this when we're doing workshops with girls because it's very clear um, what the JewelBot does and what they're gonna be able to, to program and code because you're already teaching them, okay, well, button press, that's an event. When I press a button, something happens, right? Or um, if I have a friend of this color, those colors are gonna light up. Okay, very, very easy understandable if statements, right? Uh, so let's look through the API. 
uh, when it comes to kind of uh, telling our jewel belt what we want to do, this is a basic diagram. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to pull this off so you guys can see what this looks like. Okay, um, so you can see my, my jewel bot here kind of matches that description where it's like this little horseshoe and then I've got my micro USB on the bottom. So that's kind of how we coordinate the different light colors. And so when we're wanting to light up our different LEDs, that's how we call them with our Southwest, our Northwest, our Northeast and our Southeast. Um, so that's how you can tell which, which uh, color you're lighting up. Originally, we only had the red, the blue, the magenta, yellow, cyan, and white. Since then, and largely supported by all the amazing young women in the Jewel Watts community, they've uh, at, um, released a firmware update that includes all these other new amazing colors. Um, there's actually a young woman, Ellie Galloway, who is a, a, a Jewelbots coder and does her own YouTube um, tutorials. And I believe she was one of the first girls to figure out how to combine and change her LED lights to create new colors. Um, and so she started with the rose color and then the community started creating all these different colors. And then the Jewelbots team saw this and was like, that's amazing, we're gonna put it in a firmware update. Which is really exciting to see these girls like writing code and then somebody saying, that's really good code, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it on this product. And, and really showing them the value they have to offer. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so here's our, our API for the LEDs. And if you're looking at this, um, we've got turn on single, turn off single, turn on all, flash all. And it, as a more advanced developer, you might be looking at this and going, well, this is a really simple API. Like, what's the big damn deal? But the cool thing is, if you've never read code in your life, you're going to understand exactly what turn on single means, right? you're going to understand exactly what turn all means. And so the reason I like how basic the API is is because it's very unintimidating for a beginner. And I work with beginner programmers a lot and they, I mean, coding is intimidating as shit, right? Like if, if you can remember back to like your first days and struggling to get your hello world program to work or dear God, trying to like ver vertically center align a, a div in CSS, like it's hard. Um, and so somebody's messaging me. <laughs> I know, I normally see the grin of like, hee 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 hee, I missed it, sure. Um, so the API is really, really easy and understandable and basic. Um, and the cool thing that happens when we have something very, very basic is we hit those boundaries very quickly. And you're going to hit this even quicker than you realize with kids because they're going to look at something simple and they're going to be like, no, but I want it to do this. And all of a sudden, you've lit that fire. You've got that organic pathway for them to think that something isn't pretty enough, the internet isn't pretty enough, and want to change it, and want to make more, and want to make it do better things. And again, those are the kind of engineers we want for tomorrow. Anyway, uh, so we've got some basic animations that are included. When your Jewelbot first lights up, it's actually going to cycle the Jewelbot's logo color, but we do have a basic rainbow animation, and we have kind of a breeze. So instead of just doing like a light flash, it's more of like a in and out kind of motion, which can be nice. Um, one of the interesting things about Jewelbots is they are open source. And so when they pushed out that latest firmware update for all those new colors, uh, there were a couple things that didn't get included. Like for instance, the breathe function only works with the previous colors. And so I'm actually in the middle of a pull request right now to fix making sure um, that all the colors can be breathed because it's a bit different in the way it's written. Um, so. The, the cool thing about a not perfect product is it, it allows you, again, that organic pathway to get in and create and make it better. And that can be really appealing for girls to go in and say, oh, well, I want to make it do this and I want to make it do that because that's exactly the kind of skill and the mentality we want to be teaching. <clears throat> um, when it comes to the buzzer, again, very, very sophisticated API. We've got an extra short buzz, a medium buzz, a long buzz, and a custom buzz. Uh, so the cool thing is, you know, all those really aren't that big of a deal. You could always just use the custom buzz, but we're, we're setting up for learning very, very easily here where we can start to say, okay, I can choose the length of the buzz and then I can actually set the, the strength of the buzz. So when you're talking about explaining parameters to a kid, uh, it, it's pretty easy to say, okay, well, we're going to tell it to do this and we're going to tell it to do this. It's, it's very easy to make that mental connection. <clears throat> Okay, so when we talk about the magic button, this is the code that executes when we're going to hit that. And so we've got our basic button press. We've got our button press long, which is our two Mississippi. Um, and then this is just helpful to know. We've got a charging button press. So if you ever have your Jewelbot plugged in while you're uploading code and don't want to like hassle with unplugging it and plugging it back in, um, you can use the charging button press to test your code. Uh, a couple other utility things that you might need or run into. Um, if you want to test your code, again, while it's plugged in so you don't have to keep hassling with it, you can set your run loop charging and that's going to execute that run loop when it's charging. Um, you can set Arduino coding, which is going to allow you for some basic if statements and some of that functionality. And a couple different ways that you can print out what's going on and, and debug to the monitor. Um, <clears throat> 
Moving on, we have our friendship coding mode. And so this is what the girls get really excited about, right? Is they want to make their jewel apps do things in, in tandem. Uh, and so we've got a very basic friendship library right now. And these are just going to return, you, you know, Boolean values um, when you are in Bluetooth range. So when you're in Bluetooth range of your red friends, C red friends is going to return true. Uh, so those are our basic things for how we, how we coordinate and communicate with the jewel bots. <clears throat> All right. So actually, let's look at some code. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and pull this up. Is this okay for everybody to see? Yes, maybe, sort of, kind of. Okay. Um, so I've got uh, just super basic uh, setup here. Actually, don't need that animation variable because I'm not using it. Um, but I've got some LEDs and I've got a timer, which is just going to be my timing sequence, right? But this is going to demo all the different new colors um, that we have available. So if I'm going to put this on my own JewelBot, I'm going to go ahead and well, I guess you don't have to take it off. We just had a workshop last Saturday, and this girl was just like charging at this, like she had it plugged in while on her wrist. She looked like this little android. It was hilarious. Um, so you can go ahead and pull off the cap. Um, and mine is still lit up right now because I do have blue friends nearby. Let me kill my clicker. Ugh. I'm like never ending, not enough USB port struggle. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and plug in my jewel box. Um, <laughs> and you guys just yell at me if the camera goes out of focus, because sometimes I get distracted. Uh, all right, so you guys can see what I'm doing. Hi. Any day now. No, iTunes, I do not want you right now. Thank you. All right, so now you guys can see what's going on with my Jewel Watts. All right, so I've got this plugged in. And the first thing we need to do when we want to upload our code is we want to put it into upload mode. And we do that by um, doing two Mississippi. So we've got one Mississippi, two Mississippi. And then it's going to flat, well, maybe, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. And then it's going to flash us these pretty magenta lights. And so that way we know it's in upload mode. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to upload just a basic color sketch. So the couple of key things I need to have going on here is I need to make sure that I have my port selected. Um, so as you're using different USB ports, you need to go ahead and select it and make sure you've got the right one there. Uh, and then I need to make sure that I have my right board set. So right now I'm going to go into solo coding mode because it's just me. I'm the only one. I'm, I'm kind of lame. My friends don't want to hang out with me today. So. Um, I'm in upload mode, so the next thing to do is go ahead and upload our sketch, which you've got this arrow here, and it'll start compiling. <clears throat> and it's going to give you a bunch of messages. Um, one of them is going to say, uh, where does it go? Failed to execute script main. That's just a random bug that they have going on. Hey, if you want to get an open source, you can go figure out why that's there. Make it go away. Um, but eventually, it is going to say device programmed, and it'll, oops, let me put my video back so you can see. Um, it'll light up rainbow. Oop and buzz, and I know it's programmed. All right, so I can go ahead and unplug it. And now you're going to see I'm flashing all the different colors. And they actually look a lot better when you have the JewelBot cap on. Um, so you can see all the different colors. And girls go crazy for doing their own custom colors and rainbows. Um, the Coding and Cupcakes workshop we run, we do JewelBots um, every other month, but then we do a web development course every other, month, every other month, and we let them build their own cupcake websites. So they basically go online and they pull down like this GitHub repo of a website that we've created and, and pop open a web editor and start making changes. But oh man, when they get to the CSS part, they really go nuts with choosing the style and Google fonts and everything like that. So a lot of fun. Okay, um, so there's just some basic code we can put on solo coding mode. Um, let's let's look at something more interactive. Um, here I've got uh, a kind of a basic game going on, and this was actually a game that was created by um, one of the young women in the JewelBots community. Uh, and this originally came out as Catch the Leprechaun. And so what it would do is it'd cycle through all the different colors, and when the color is green, you're supposed to click the button. That means you catch the leprechaun, and then if you um, and it'll light up rainbow for you. And if you click on the wrong color, uh, it'll buzz right at you and be like, "Oh, loser! You you didn't kill the leprechaun or catch the leprechaun." Um, 
So we've got you know some basic coding here, but again, very, very simple game, but this is a very easy way to talk, talk to a kiddo and start to explain like, how are we gonna make this happen? Like, how are we gonna determine what the color is and, and start to explore setting variables and everything like that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and upload this code and, and pass it around and let you guys play. Well, this is gonna be Catch the Rose just cause that's my favorite color um, on the jewel bots right now. But so what am I gonna do to um, do my jewel bot is I'm gonna put it in upload mode. So one Mississippi, two Mississippi. All right, I've got my magenta lights. So I can go ahead and upload my code. Um, so I'm gonna make sure that I have my right port selected. Uh, I cannot remember. Um, there's a, a bug right now where some of the features aren't available in the solo coding mode and the friendship coding mode. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and use my um, friendship coding mode board just in case. Um, and if you're ever in the wrong board mode, it's immediately gonna throw an error message at you and won't compile. So it's, it's not the end of the world if that happens. I'm gonna go ahead and let that upload. And uh, while we're, uh, let's see how long that's gonna take. Okay, um, so while that uploads, if I can get my two jewel bots back up here with my lovely demoers. She, she can bring it up. All right, I, I'm gonna have you ladies come up and we're gonna put some um, custom code on your jewel bot so they do something different. Okay. Um, all right, so that went ahead and uploaded. We've got our device programmed message. And so now we're gonna blink rainbow colors and we're gonna, we're gonna try and catch the rose. Um, so I'll, you guys can play the game here. Ready? Catch. All right, there you go, and you can pass that one around. Okay, so we have two jewel bots that are still paired, and we're in friendship mode. Um, but what if we don't want it to just blink red? What if we want it to rainbow light whenever our friends are around? <laughs> it's cool to an eight-year-old, trust me. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you guys are like, oh, I need more coffee before dealing with this bitch on stage. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, Somebody's messaging. Okay, uh, so I've got a basic sketch here where we're gonna do something, but um, these are both paired on red friends, so we're gonna go ahead and change that. Uh, make sure you guys can see that, okay. All right, so we've got our red, and you cannot command D in, in the Arduino IDE, which kills me, because that's like most of my coding, but um, go ahead and switch that to red. And so now what's gonna happen is if we see red friends, it's gonna do a rainbow animation. It's gonna pause for a little bit and then it will stay red so we know that it's our red friend that is causing the rainbow. So I'm gonna go ahead and upload this code. Doop, doop, do. Uh, what do I do to put it in upload mode? Hold twice. Two Mississippi. <laughs> yeah, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. All right, we are in upload mode, and so I'm gonna go ahead and put this code on there. I'm gonna make sure I'm in friendship coding mode because that's what we're doing here. <laughs> Port. Uh, friendship coding mode, okay. All right, and we're gonna go ahead and upload some custom code here. And then your jewel bot is gonna do something very special. Um, <laughs> Uh, when you guys are in range of each other. So I'll let you see that in a second. <laughs> hmm? Hers isn't gonna do it unless I upload the code on it. We should do hers too. You wanna do hers too? Okay. <laughs> and then I'll show you some debugging steps because one of the things to know is while your JewelBot is charging, it's not gonna recognize other JewelBots via Bluetooth mode. So it's only, or it's only gonna be lighting up or doing whatever that friendship function is when it's uncharged. All right, so. We now have our special code. Yay, you have rainbows now when you have a friend around. I that one again. Yep. So now I need to run out and run back in and then this again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you want to. All right, so now we're going to give you rainbows too and you can feel very special as well. Okay. Do you want to feel special? Sure. <laughs> I already feel special, but I can feel more special. Okay. It's always good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, hold well, on if I hold it down long enough. Figure while you're all waiting, you can come see me talk tomorrow at 10:20. There's Ooh. a plug. Excellent plug. What room? Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the app. You can look at the app. All right, I'm gonna give you some special rainbow code. Yay! <laughs> all right. Um, while that is uploading, uh, we can go ahead. Oh, I don't have my clicker anymore. 
Uh, we can look through some basic debugging steps because these are going to these are what you're going to run into a lot. Is your dual button upload mode? Did you hold it down for two Mississippi? Do you have the right port selected? Do you have the right board selected? Um, and then if all else fails, uh, kind of the basic way to reset your Joolbot is upload a blank sketch to wipe out whatever code you had on there previously, because sometimes it can get a little squirrely. Um, but you can upload a blank sketch, um, and if anything's really going weird, upload a blank sketch in firmware mode, and that'll solve pretty much any problem you have. Um, the only other thing that can happen sometimes is uh, Joolbots will get stuck in uploading mode, um, and they're working on patching this right now, but if that ever happens, um, we always carry around our magic safety pins, and so there's actually this button inside here that you can just press with the safety pin real quick and it'll get it unstuck. Um, or do a factory reset, whatever you're looking to do. So um, let's check on your code. Oops, all right, so we, we've got something. I did something wrong here. All right, it's plugged in. Um, this might have just gotten stuck in upload mode, actually. Oh, I did not have my port selected. Okay. Live debugging. <clears throat> okay, while that is uploading, um, I'm going to let you guys watch a little video. And this is Ellie Galloway, Hi, is um, who Galloway. will I'm teach us how to do LED, LED lights to while I wait for this to upload. Color for Geobot. These are of the colors we can use, but what if we want to use a different one? Go to Arduino. I don't know if you can see, but she's got like the little Jewelbots logo in like the right. top where her video is. Void. Set up. That's pretty awesome. Rainbows. Rainbows. Next, we're going to skip a line and do void loop. And the same thing. And uh, do I think she's eight. your own code. Um, actually, uh, Ellie so just did her first uh, live stage presentation at Red Hat so Summit, um, where she was actually live coding Joolbots on stage. So, so yes. Uh, so uh, that uploaded pretty quickly. All right, so now we have rainbow friends. So every couple seconds, those are going to cycle rainbow. Oh, yours was in messaging mode. Yep. So that's some of the cool functionality we can do and put on there um, when we have friendship mode enabled. So yay! Okay. Uh, thank you for being amazing demoers. All right. And if anybody wants to come up after the talk and kind of play with these or ask questions, feel free. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to switch back to my clicker. Ah. Oh. I'm going to get like an adapter that has like H eight HDMI ports and then I will be fine. Okay. Um, so wanted to do another quick note that, yeah, again, um, Jewelbots is always looking for open source contributors. So if this is, some, if you'd like to do more open source contribution or maybe you're pair programming with a young woman who's excited about Jewelbots, this can be a really great way to get her into it. Um, they've got a couple different repos. They've got one for uh, the friendship library, one for the solo coding mode and, and some of their basic stuff there. Um, so fun to explore. <clears throat> Okay, so let's talk about, you know, mentoring girls running a, success in running a successful Jewelbots workshop. Uh, the number one thing is keep your hands off the keyboard. And I know it can be really tempting because there's nothing worse than watching somebody to go to google.com and then go down to the box that appears and then type in their actual search query. Like, it, it kills me on the inside. But... Um, Keep your hands off the keyboard no matter what they do. Uh, kids will pick up keyboard commands so amazingly fast. Like you teach them command C once and they will use it forever. Um, so absolutely feel free to use keyboard commands and everything like that. But the best way for them to learn is actually hands on the keyboard implementing everything. Um, let them make mistakes. And I feel like this is really hard as programmers because we're going to spot like some sort of syntax error or a typo right away. Um, but if you're solving their problems for them all the time, you're depriving them of this really, really valuable debugging skill, which we all know is very, very important. Um, so if you see a mistake starting to happen, like maybe they forgot to put it in upload mode, don't say anything. And then when it doesn't work, talk through them. Hey, what did we, what did we miss? What are the possible problems that could have caused this? Because it's really going to teach her to start debugging and figuring out problems on her own and not be terrified every time an error appears in the console. Um, and, and that what we really want to get excited for is a new error in the console. That's progress, right? Um, along the same vein, don't give her the answer. Help her find it. Um, and I want to show you guys the um, jewel bots to... Um, uh, just lost my word. Documentation. Thank you. 
Uh, so if you can, instead of giving her the answer, why don't you say, hey, let's go explore the documentation. Hmm, you want an animation? Let's go look and, and find out how to make that happen. Um, and so you can actually go through here and kind of see all the different resources. So Coding Solo, we've got um, our basics about our, our LEDs and our colors available and, and what the API is and what the parameters are and how to call that. Um, and so teaching her the skills of going in, reading documentation and understanding instead of just like regurgitating an answer is really, really crucial. Mm -mm. Um, teach her how to read the documentation. So instead of, you know, you scrolling the page and you finding what you need, be like, um, why don't you read everything and kind of figure out what you want to do? Or if you have this one idea in mind, why don't, why don't we see if we can find that somewhere on the page? Um, help her create diagrams of her ideas. This really comes into play when we're doing stuff that's going to um, depend on, on the way we want our LEDs to light. Like, let's say we're doing like a chasing rainbow animation, right, where we're going to have to turn one on a color and then turn it off and then turn the next one on and turn a color. Um, it can be a really good whiteboarding exercise to go and start diagramming out and say, it's okay to think about your code before actually typing on the computer. And be patient. Um, and this can be really hard because we're expert know-it-alls, right? And we're like, ah, all the time. Um, but being patient, letting her make mistakes um, is going to be really crucial in, in her learning process and feeling good about her skills. Uh, if you're excited about JewelBots like I am and you're like, oh man, this would be awesome. I'd love to run a workshop, like whether it's at work or for like, you know, a bunch of, of young women in your life. Uh, a couple tips to make sure that that workshop is really, really successful. Um, the first thing you need to do is make sure that everybody knows the requirements. So when I mentioned uh, the laptop needing to have a USB port, make sure that people are aware if they have a newer back, they're going to have to bring that adapter. Uh, make sure they have admin rights if they're bringing a work computer, that kind of thing. But um, make this known to your attendees as much as possible. Um, whatever your, your event registration platform is or um, however you're, you're getting the word out, right? Uh, prep your mentors with the guide and debugging tip. All the programs we run isn't just like an instructor in front of a room. We've got um, at least kind of a, a one to three mentor ratio. So like one mentor to three attendees, right? Um, and so prepping your mentors and letting them know what we're going to be working on today can kind of help them be in the right mindset to figure out and... and um, help debugging the issues. Hardware is always going to be way more complicated than software because there's so many more things that can that can go wrong. Um, and so just making your mentors aware of that and have, making sure everybody has their magic safety pin and knowing what to do with uploading a factory firmware sketch that's blank can really be helpful. Um, communicate the goals of the workshop. Explain the what and why. And this is really important because we know exactly why we're using the tools we're using. We know exactly what we're trying to do. But if you're a beginner and there are all these terms being thrown at you, like what's, what's GitHub, what's, what's Arduino, what's, uh, what's Code Anywhere, what's an IDE? Um, these are really big terms that we're used to, but um, somebody attending a workshop or doing coding for the first time might not understand why. Why are they downloading an, Ard um, an Arduino? Why does that matter? Oh, well, this is where we're going to write the code that we're going to put on the JewelBot. Um, so really explaining the what and the why are huge here. Um, a thing to know is installing the board can take 10 to 15 minutes, especially if you're on shitty Wi-Fi. Um, so if you can't have the attendees do it ahead of time, but most of the time when we do any kind of pre-instructions for our attendees at any age level, they'd much prefer to, to come in and do it um, in, in the session and, and get help because computers are scary and they don't want to like break their computer or like launch a missile or something. Um, be prepared for different learning speeds. And again, this goes back to everybody learning at a different pace and, and wanting everybody to feel okay that their learning style is, is, is what matters and it doesn't matter if they're not learning as quickly as somebody else. Um, so the workshop, if you have it perfectly outlined, know that your outline will go to shit and some people will race through the curriculum and some people will really struggle. And so if you can be prepared for that, you're going to be in a, a better mental space for the workshop. Um, have some sort of guide or curriculum prepared, and that doesn't need to be a step-by-step -step guide or anything like that, but have some sort of structure, because if you're not going to be able to attend everybody one-on-one, -on -one, if somebody gets stuck and doesn't know what to do next, they're going to get really frustrated really quickly, and so it can be helpful to have some sort of guide or, or paired piece to your workshop. Uh, this is really key, having follow-up resources ready, because so many times people run a coding program and they like put all this effort and all this energy into this one day thing, and then the, the kids love it, and they're like, how do I get more, what do I do next? And the person's like, uh, I have no idea. So one of the best things you can do is be aware of all the STEM and technology resources in your area and kind of have that ready to go and say, hey, um, come check out our Coder No Joke chapter. It's every second Saturday of the month or have next steps for them to get involved. Uh, we also are really strong on pushing all our attendees to get involved in the JewelBots community and forums because there are a bunch of young girls like in the eight to 13 range in the forums communicating with each other, showing off their projects so that can be really powerful. 
Um, and finally, expect some chaos. Uh, nothing ever goes perfectly in coding and running a workshop and event planning ever. Um, so just be prepared for that. But it's a lot of fun. And, and there's nothing better than watching a, a kid get excited about programming, right? It's like you get to relive your first Hello World moment over and over again when you see the joy and excitement on their face when their first code uploads and compiles. There's nothing quite like it. Um, so a couple on ongoing learning resources for you guys. Again, the Jewelbox Forum. Uh, these are, have become kind of big, the subscription box models. And they've actually started to create STEM subscription boxes for kids, which are awesome. So they're going to come with a whole bunch of different activities, uh, programming, robotics, all sorts of things. Um, Little Bits is another hardware piece that you can do some custom coding for. Uh, Girls Who Code uh, kind of started out as a summer immersion program. They've recently been launching a club model um, that I think launches every fall. And so those are really great resources to explore. You don't have to be a programmer to run a club. They have curriculum provided for you. So you can just be like, you know, an adult who wants to herd cats. Um, this is our local stuff, Coder Dojo KC, Coding and Cupcakes KC. Um, we have a ton of documentation about the way we run things and kind of the things we do to, to run a successful workshop. Um, so you're more than happy to hit up myself or my team for any help you might need. <clears throat> and then finally, if, if you're excited and you want to get your own jewel bots, I've got a couple different ways for you. You can use a special discount code, and feel free to take a picture of this with your phone. Um, but you can use the code code with Jennifer um, for 20 bucks off. Um, there's actually a European distributor. I know shipping can be kind of difficult sometimes. Um, so there's a link there that you might be able to get it at a cheaper cost and not have to deal with the shipping. Make sure everybody's done with the photos. OK, finally, any questions? Any questions? <laughs> Did you just prove that C++ is fine for 10-year-olds and 8-year-olds? Mm -hmm. Good to know. I mean, Scratch is fun, but this is pretty fun, too. And it's so damn readable that, yeah. And there are debugging errors, which is the best part, right? Like, there's no error in Scratch. There's no way to do something wrong. So other questions? Um, so I, I normally tell parents, um, as long as they can read and use a mouse, they're going to be successful. Um, cause that way they can like read and figure out what's going on. Um, I, a lot of our programs, we say seven to 17, um, but we've got like five or six year olds that'll like be rocking out their scratch projects. And there's this little guy, Jack, he's like this tall and we have to like physically lift him onto the podium to be able to present at Coder Dojo. Um, that being said, for stuff like Jewelbots, I think like the 8 to 13 range is probably appropriate. Um, I think older girls, it might not be as exciting and, and they might be more interested in like a web dev track. But the cool thing about Jewelbots is they're so immediately tangible. Like you know exactly what's going on. You're making an LED light up. You're making something buzz. Um, and so there's a really big excitement factor there. All right, well, if you are not a question person and want to come up and chat, feel free to say hi. Otherwise, have a lovely rest of your day in conference.